Hi, everybody. Welcome to another link gathering. Uh, just waiting for Steve to join us. Um, hang on a second. I can resend the link. Uh, somehow. Thanks very much, Paul and Chris, for volunteering to uh, share your uh, link story with us. Share how you use link. Uh, feel free to share your screen if you like. Uh, there's a share screen option at the bottom of the page. Click on it and choose the window that you want to share or if, feel free not to share. It's up to you, of course. Uh, let us know how you use link, how much you've enjoyed. Um, I don't know how long you've been using it. Maybe start by introducing yourself, of course. Um, oh, someone is already sharing, uh, which means, must mean, Chris, you want to start. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I can hear you, Chris. Is, is your microphone, right. might, the audio settings might need to be. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, well, why don't, uh, you know, I guess hopefully everybody's keeping well here uh, as we continue to stay home and um, look forward to, to hearing from, from our guests today. Chris, maybe, yeah, with that, please introduce yourself and then maybe share a bit about, uh, about using uh, how you use Link. Okay. Um... Yeah, my name is Chris, uh, Chris Young, and uh, I'm a retired doctor. I, I retired a year ago. And uh, if I could just briefly explain my language journey and how Link fits into it, if that's okay, with your permission. Yeah, please, please do. Um, we're, we're looking at your email right now. Yeah, I don't know if you want to, want to be showing something else, but uh, just to let you know. Right. Um, okay, I'll just close that. I'm not seeing you very well. I'm, I'm pretty new to, to Zoom, but I'm learning it on the job, as it were. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, yeah, so I retired just over a year ago, and my wife sent me a link to Lydia Makova's well-known TED Talk, which I'm sure most of you know. Mm -hmm. And... To cut a long story short, uh, I had to wait for one of her academies and I said, what should I do in the meantime? Because I'd learned French at school, and I thought I'd resurrect that. So they, the very helpful team uh, pointed me towards uh, French podcasts because I was focusing on French. So the first podcast I listened to was in a French with Hugo Cotton which mm -hmm. is very good uh, for intermediate listeners. He, he speaks relatively slowly and very clearly. It's a very good resource, interesting topic. <clears throat> and just fast forward to later in the year when he interviewed Steve. And that's when I heard about Link for the first time. So that was about six months ago. And shortly after that, uh, I started listening to Steve's YouTubes. And all of a sudden, he was learning three languages at once. So I thought, OK, <laughs> I'll give it a go, too. And it was a bit mad, of course. Insane, I think, is your expression on, on, the, uh, on the app. 100 right. links a day <laughs> with three different languages, which is quite a tall order, as I think Steve found. Uh, so I cut that down to 50. Uh, and, and then later on, we planned a fairly short notice, a trip to Rio. So I started learning Brazilian Portuguese as well. So that's four languages, which was totally insane. But not so insane because they're all romance languages and so it was you know relatively easy to 
fit them all in. And of course, the resources are on link. You can look look at in various different languages. You know, like Steve's language Odyssey and the uh, mini stories and so forth. Um, and just to expand a bit on the Spanish resources that I've been using. Uh, <clears throat> again, focused on intermediate level. Uh, and I look at them on link, of course. Uh, uh, just checking my notes here. Um, yeah, Unlimited Spanish is a very good resource with uh, Oscar Bayus. Mm -hmm. um, nice topics. A little smattering of grammar, but that's okay. Not not too much. And notes in Spanish, intermediate, and they, they do beginners and also uh, advanced. And I focused on intermediate. And they they use a, a formula which seems to work very well, I think, in these resources, which is a conversation between two people. One right. of which has to be a native speaker. So, uh, so I think that's a very good formula. Mm -hmm. And in Portuguese, uh, I started uh, looking at Portuguese three months before we went on holiday. And I found Brazilian pod class and Brazilian Portuguese podcast. And also using links resources, you know, the mini stories and so forth. And I must say, I thought Link was brilliant because I was able to get past what I would term phrase book Portuguese. You know, where are the toilets? Two beers, please. You know, and you want you want a bit more than that when you go on holiday. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that's really what I want to say. And what what I what I do my my daily use of link is I try to do 50 links a day in each of the four languages and they're all romance languages so they all fit in nicely and I uh, review as I go along um, you know it depends on how things pan out you know I don't always manage to do the 50 links first thing in the morning but that's the goal right and then I try to make use of dead time during the day. But I would just add add something which I think is pertinent to the times we're living in now. And that is, <clears throat> I don't listen to languages when I'm outside because listening to the bird song and looking at the blue sky is actually very good for the well-being at the moment. <laughs> So that's just a personal thing. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, if you use too much of your dead time, you know, your wife says, you're always walking around with your earplugs in. <laughs> so, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, that's about my story. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for sharing. That's. Um... Yeah, great. Uh, some great resources there for our audience who are studying those languages. And uh, uh, how long? So, so uh, how long have you been on on Link? Uh, just under six months. Okay. Okay. Great. Can I make and, a comment, Mark? Sure. Yeah. No, I just think the uh, when I was on that uh, hundred links a day in each of three languages, unconnected languages, Persian, Arabic, and Turkish, that was a bit much. But I, I maintained it for quite a while. And I think the idea that you're forced to do something that's almost like a, it's like a mechanical task. You have to do it, okay? You have to take out the garbage once a week, whatever it is, it's a, it's a mechanical task. Even if you aren't particularly interested, you've set yourself that goal, that kind of works. And it forces you into new material. Uh, I found though that with Persian and Arabic being very difficult to read because it takes so long to get used to that script. That it was just too tough. But if you're doing four romance languages and you're forcing yourself to do 50 links in each language, that means you're pushing yourself into new content 
a lot of the vocabulary is going to be familiar, just slightly look slightly different in the other language. I think that's very doable and it just keeps you going. I think that's a really good uh, thing to do. And the other question I had was, uh, you mentioned podcasts. Have you listened to both Brazilian Portuguese and podcasts from Portugal or are you strictly listening to Brazilian Portuguese? No, I've, I've listened to both because I okay. picked up a comment from one of your YouTubes, which right. said it doesn't really matter when you're a beginner, which I agree with. I mean, the Portuguese from Portugal is more difficult to understand, but I think it's in any of these languages where people get so fast, oh, I don't want to listen to Spanish from Spain or from Mexico. It doesn't really matter. It's essentially the same words. And you may as well get used to these different, uh, you know, ways people pronounce the language. It only improves the flexibility of your brain. And at some point, if you want to focus in on one, then you focus in on one in order to imitate that pronunciation. But I always recommend people shouldn't get too fussed about whether this is Quebecois French or French from France or whatever. Just it's yeah, the language. That's, that's right. If I could chip in there again, uh, I came across a, a restaurateur in South Africa from from Madeira. And so, so I tried out my Brazilian Portuguese on him. I mean, he understood what I meant, <laughs> but he knew I was talking Brazilian Portuguese. And he said, next time you come, I want you to speak Angolan Portuguese and Madeira Portuguese. <laughs> so uh, maybe I won't do that, but uh, it's, it's fun. Uh, the, yeah. the other thing I wanted to chip in with was, uh, it's, it's a very nerdish thing to do, but I, I write down cognates just as a, a diversion. You know, if I pick up a, a word in one language, and I check the others in the other language, the equivalent, and it's, it's, it's good fun. <laughs> it's fun to do if you're in related languages like uh, Polish and uh, Ukrainian and Russian and Czech and whatever. It's always fun. Variety is the spice of life. Do what we like to do. <laughs> Um, we have a question from, from the audience here. My question, uh, is, can I do both a link and Rosetta stone mix to learn a language? Well, I, Mark has some experience with, with Rosetta stone. I don't really. So I, I always say though, do what you like to do. And, uh, variety is important. If you're covering the same material in two or three different ways, that's good. Um, you know, when before we had Link, if I started to learn a language, I would buy two or three starter books. So I covered the same starter material in two or three different books. They're only twenty, thirty dollars each. Uh, but I have no idea about Rosetta Stone. Mark, you did this Rosetta Stone for Japanese, I think. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like you say, I mean, you can if you're a beginner, then you can do a bit of Rosetta Stone or some other beginner thing um but uh you know as soon as possible you kind of want to get out of that stage and into uh using real content um like we do on link um to really kind of drive your growth and and you know whatever the tool is most tools that are out there really they really only get you started so um yeah if you'd like rosetta stone go for it um it's it, it's not a, it's not a bad thing to do uh, definitely use link with it. So you get input, like what, what you don't get in most other tools, you just don't get the volume of input that you need, like the listening and the reading. So, um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, another question, how, how do you maintain the languages that you know, and, and feel free uh, uh, Chris and Paul to also chime in if you have thoughts on any of these questions. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I could deal I, with the maintaining uh, issue because yeah. people always ask me with so many languages and learning new languages, how do you maintain the languages that you know? So first of all, I don't worry about it. Uh, languages that I already know may slip in the short run. However, my experience is when I go back to them, they quickly recover to where they were. And if anything, I end up further along than I ever was. So when I go to refresh a language, and like some of my weaker languages, if I have to, uh, you know, make a video in the language or something, then there's two strategies. One is if I'm fairly good at the language, I'll just read in the language, get a book in German, uh, listen to a podcast in Portuguese, 
Uh, if I'm not so strong in the language, I'll go back to the mini stories. To me, the mini stories, it's like, uh, you know how in, in working out, you have core exercises. The, the, the theory being that if you really work your core, your abs, your back, that gives you strength that enables you to do well in, in whatever sport you're going to do. Like the core is important to build up a strong core. And I think the mini stories are like the core. So I go back to them because they have the most common expressions, the most common verbs, the most common conjunctions and connecting words and phrases. And so to refresh, I'll either just do something in the language if I'm fairly good at it, or I'll go back to the mini stories. But I never do it in the sense of, oh, gee, I might forget the language or I'm slipping. I don't worry about it. Well, if I've been away from the language, when I start up again, I'm going to slip and I'm going to stumble. But very quickly, I'll be back to where I was. And, and pretty soon, I found that that this absence, maybe because I've been working my brain to learn other languages, if anything, makes me better in those languages than I was before. So it's just not a concern of mine. OK. I see uh, Rodney's asking, where are the mini stories? You should just be able to search in the library, go to the library tab and search for mini stories or link mini stories. But mini stories should should show you those stories. They're typically are also in the lesson feed um, as many users are using them and liking them. Um, is, do you have something to say, Chris? No, I just wanted to add to uh, maintaining different languages at once. Uh, what I do is I focus the listening on a different language each day of the week, which is a bit random. I mean, I, I don't do it in a strict order. Whatever pops up on link, then I choose that language to focus my listening on. So that's the way I handle four different languages at once. <laughs> okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, actually, Chris, can you stop sharing your screen now? Uh, uh -huh. okay. 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 So it was me all along. Sorry. No, that's all right. <laughs> uh, Paul, maybe you, yeah, you'd like to go next and, uh, yeah, sure. Tell us um, a bit about yourself. So like I've only really been using Link for the past like three, four months. So I'm still a beginner, I would say. Um, but I'm trying to share my screen, but I don't think it's going to let me. Uh, uh, no, it's not going to let me. Um, when I very first started using it, I usually just go into the uh, beginners bit and the intermediate bit into the uh, like kind of bit in the library. Um, when I was in there, I found like a couple of channels on YouTube. So the first one was uh, Espanol Automatico and uh, Easy Spanish, which were just like 10 minute videos, 10, 20 minute videos of just people speaking. Um, I found them to be like, quite helpful when, when learning. Um, after I got bored of them, which was quite fast, to be honest, um, I started watching uh, Netflix, like started just downloading episodes of, like El Chapo, things in the, there. And uh, what I would do is I would maybe just watch 15, 20 minutes and then go to the translation to try and figure out the bits that I'd missed and kind of try and try and figure out what's what's going on in there. Um, after that, um, I kind of realized that there's a lot more, like you can cover a lot more words by like listening to audio books. So I would listen to audio books and read at the same time. So I would usually just uh, find out what the Spanish translation was to the book I wanted to read. So if, like everyone else, I think Harry Potter is my favorite book. So I uh, started reading Harry Potter and um, I've read some, read, read some of Dan Brown's books as well. Um, usually I just find if you go to Google and um, you type in the book that you want and just put PDF at the end, it usually just comes up like the first link and you'll be able to just import the book into Link. Um, but yeah, I've just been listening to the audio books. I think the audio books um, help quite a bit. Um, yeah, I've I found like a read to get good audio though. You, you probably have to buy them. There is um, some like on YouTube, but usually you get way halfway through and you realize that the other half isn't there. Um, so I've just got Audible now. So I just like buy the books on Audible and then listen and read it at the same time. Yeah, uh, that's great. I, I think uh, I, I agree, have to agree with you that 
YouTube videos and, and Netflix are, they're fun for sure, but the, the, the word density that you get in, in, uh, with books, audiobooks and, and eBooks, is, it's just uh, in terms of for Link, when you start progressing, uh, you end up, I end up feeling like I, I wish I could find, or I, I want to find good books and uh, I'm having a tough time with that. And Japanese right now because it seems they make it very hard to get Japanese books uh, online but uh, I know when I was doing Italian it was great I got lots of books to choose from and I did the same I had uh, Audible so I whatever audiobooks were available in Italian on Audible those are the books I would then go try and find um, I, there's an Italian audiobooks uh, store that I would buy them from but uh, it's, um, or that, that search, that's a good idea too. Um, uh, although we don't, we can't recommend, we recommend buying them, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, that's a great way for sure to, uh, to use link. I mean, you import a book and you've got content for weeks. Um, um, yeah, it, it, Could I it, chime it, in on that. Sure. Mark, just to, to, again, agree with what both of you are saying. Uh, movies are fun. Movies are stimulating. Uh, I remember when I started into Russian, I saw some Russian movies for the Soviet movies are really good quality. And there were some wonderful movies about the 19th century. And, you know, you get all excited. It's very, it's, it's very, you know, stimulating, but it's hard to learn from them. And you have to sit there in front of the screen, right? And, and the word density in books is so much higher. And especially if the script isn't an obstacle, like even, even the Cyrillic alphabet is not a big problem, but with, with the Persian and Arabic, it's just that much more difficult. But like Polish, I found there's an, a website called Audioteka, T, Audio T-E-K-A, and it has audio books in Polish and Czech and stuff. And then there's websites where you can get the ebook. And I don't mind paying for the audio book or the ebook because as Mark says, you got it for a month, you know, because it takes a long time to go through a book. But when you do it, like I remember, I knew this person who was a Swedish, uh, the wife of one of my business associates and uh, she loved French and she traveled to France. And I once gave her an audio book in French, some novel. And she said, oh, it's too difficult. I can't understand it. I think to really get your comprehension up, you, you should set yourself a goal. At some point, I'm going to listen to an audio book a novel but of course it's going to be difficult so you need to get the ebook so you can work your way through it and get the words and phrases but it's a tremendous achievement and and it's a tre tremendous experience to listen to an audiobook in the language you're learning that's kind of like a, a major milestone when you achieve that so i think audiobooks and ebooks are are more powerful really and, and, and i guess how quickly you can go there depends on how similar the language is to a language you know how familiar the writing system is but Audiobooks and ebooks are good value. Unfortunately, and I can't remember what the term is, but a lot of the ebooks are protected by whatever it is, and you can't import them into Link, even if you've paid for them. And I find that extremely annoying. That's the I, DRM. DRM, yeah. Yeah, and, and there are ways to remove it, and I think it's fine to remove it. You're using it for your own personal use, but it's still not that easy i think uh, kindle can be really difficult to to remove the drm for um yeah it's just an it's just another obstacle so it it prevents people from doing it like as you say even if you buy the ebook it's hard to get it isn't it's link hard. working on a drm removal uh, system that we can sell uh, <laughs> <laughs> well we would love at some point to have some some arrangement with publishers so that we could actually have integrated audiobooks and E, e, audio ebooks, I guess, available through Link. I mean, that would make it way easier for everybody. But um, the, the whole book world seems very um, convoluted in, in, in the way it manages rights. And uh, I don't know exactly how the best way we, we would uh, tackle that is, but someday for sure we'd like to do that because books are great content, uh, especially to really kind of. You, you one book can 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 add you know five thousand known words i find like it once you get going it really drives vocabulary growth you know it's if i could interject too i think it's very unfortunate so many people want to learn languages 
And so then you have teachers or language experts writing yet another grammar book on Spanish, yet another, you know, whatever system. If only audiobooks and ebooks were readily available. Okay, you got to pay for it, but then you've got it. You can import it. You can do what you want with it. And similarly with podcasts, there are so many podcasts out there, like those podcasts out of Portugal that are really very good, like hours and hours of podcasts, no transcripts. All my Persian and Arabic podcasts, no transcripts. Somehow, and then, and then like here in Canada, we have our national broadcasters, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and Radio Canada, who are apparently investing millions of dollars to develop some kind of language teaching website where there'll be comprehension questions and all kinds of useless stuff like that. If they would just provide transcripts for all their programming, you know, and so there's programming in English, programming in French, their stuff and then on news, on history, on cooking, on sports, you name it. People could go to not just CBC in Canada, but BBC in Britain or whatever it might be in other countries, and they would have access to all this stuff to learn. That would be the biggest contribution any of these podcasters and broadcasters could make to the world of, of language learning. Don't come up with another system, another grammar book, and all this other useless stuff. Just give us content that can be mined at link or on other sites, but where you can save words and phrases, you can work your way through these things where you always have the transcript for the audio, you have the audio for the text. That's what the world of language learning needs, in my opinion. <laughs> Someday we'll get there. <laughs> Could I chip in again there? Sure. Because I, uh, I had an idea, I often get ideas these days. Uh, it's generally held that language classes are a waste of time. And I sort of agree with that from my own experience. You know, you pay a lot of money and you go to the course and you're bored with the grammar after a very short time and then half the class leave and then the class folds up completely. But the, the point of the story is that if people want to learn a language, they usually sign up to a class first. And my contention is, the problem is the way the language class is run. In other words, if the content is engaging and entertaining, then people stick with it. And if you use the same principles that we all know, listening and reading and no grammar, then I think the concept of the language class could change for the better. And in fact, what I'm intending to do is set up exactly that to, I mean, I don't, I don't pretend to be a language teacher, but I've learned a lot about language acquisition in the last year. And so what I hope to do is speak with a native speaker for a few minutes uh, say 20 minutes and then we have a cup of coffee in a coffee shop and then the second half involves telling people how to acquire language efficiently and in an entertaining fashion and then you share the resources that you use you found you know these Spanish podcasts are good and the free content is very good but you know be a bit wary about the paid content because it's quite expensive and that's the sort of thing I would hope to do to improve the concept of the language class. I wonder if I could jump in there, Mark. Uh, a couple of, I see a couple of questions that I, I'd like to respond to. Uh, first of all, Sviatoslav Maximiv has two comments or questions here. One is, what do we think of studying several languages at primary school? And then the second thing, grammar is necessary for everyone. Um, so two comments on that. First of all, I think it would be a good idea to expose kids to more than one language in primary school, but that the emphasis should be on comprehension, on exposing them to the language without any tests, without any comprehension questions, without worrying about what they understand. Just let them get a sense of two or three languages. Good for the brain, improves the, their call it receptivity to different sounds, different languages have different sounds, different structures. Uh, Obviously, if they had a system like Link, they could look up words, they would hear, they would listen to stories and not be tested on it. And if they did that for five or six years through primary school, 
exposing themselves to two or three languages. At some point, if they got very serious uh, and really wanted to learn one of those languages, they would be in great shape to do so. So I think it's a good idea to expose kids to a lot of languages in primary school. Second of all, grammar is necessary. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that deliberate grammar instruction is effective. Uh, what is necessary at some point is to speak the language as accurately as we can. And or not necessarily necessary, but what most people aspire to. Most people want to speak with as few mistakes as possible. And in order to speak with few mistakes, we need to have a lot of input in the language so that our brain can get used to it. And once we have a lot of input and we are familiar to some extent with the language, only then do the grammar explanations make sense. Whereas if we try to learn grammar rules and produce them correctly on a test on Friday, we will forget all of those rules. We won't be able to put them into practice. We won't be able to think of the rules when we're trying to speak. Whereas if we go through this process of massive input, we develop habits that enable us to naturally speak more and more correctly, but never 100% correctly. So that's my comment on that. One other thing too, if I just looking at these questions, how to break out of the intermediate level, continue doing what you're doing. And how the best use of tutors is to have a conversation, make sure the tutor gives you a report, 10, 50, the way we do it, link 10 or 15 phrases that you didn't use correctly. And then you have that as a conversation report. And I was listening to my converse and my tutors in Persian and Arabic, they record them and in Turkish, they record them so I can listen to my conversation reports of a, of a year ago, six months ago, and go through them. And I set link to listen to course audio, which I find extremely useful. I used to actually create my playlist. Now I just go listen to course audio. So I've got 20 conversation reports, one right after the other. And what I find is that I make the same mistake every week because the tutor is giving me the same corrective phrase every week, but that's fine. Eventually, you know, I improve. So that I would recommend to get out of the intermediate level, continue doing what you're doing, vary the kind of content you're listening to, force yourself to create 50 links a day so that you're pushing yourself to new content, and then start talking to a tutor with the objective that you're going to be reviewing these conversation reports, both listening to them and reading them from time to time, just to vary your activity in the language. And you just have to continue. We have another question. Is it possible to become fluent slash near fluent from just using link. Okay, okay, if I can tell, no, fluent implies speaking fluently. In order to speak fluently, you have to speak a lot. So I think even if you use a tutor at link, you can't get enough speaking uh, time just talking to someone one, you know, twice or three times a week to really become fluent. So Link is going to build you up in terms of your vocabulary, in terms of your listening comprehension. Uh, it's going to create the potential and it's going to create habits in your brain, listening to mini stories amongst other things. It's going to build up the capability so that if you then manage to get into situations where you use the language a lot, maybe you have a circle of friends where you live that speak the language or you go to the country, then you can work towards fluency. Um, yeah, I mean, if I look at my own case, uh, I think I speak Russian well enough. I speak with mistakes. I speak it well enough to uh, be interviewed on, you know, Ru uh, Russian and Ukrainian language television in Ukraine when I was last there. I have given talks in Russian via Skype with mistakes, and I learned all of that on Link. But I probably had maybe a hundred hours, oh, and this is over a period of years. This is over a period of four or five years. But I have read two million words in Russian. I have listened to, I don't know how many thousands of hours of Russian. I've read, you know, books and stuff like that. So it's possible, it takes a long time, but ultimate, and I was in Russia for 12 days. And I, so I spoke Russian while I was there and I was in Ukraine for 12 days and spoke Russian, at least in the Eastern side of the country. So. I still think you need to get that opportunity to speak a lot and link builds you up to a level where you can quickly work towards fluency given the opportunity. Okay. 
Uh, there was a question, uh, a few questions on YouTube, but someone's asking which language is, which language I'm studying. Uh, I'm currently studying Japanese. Before that, I was studying, I guess, Spanish and before that, Italian. So trying to get my Japanese level up, trying to find, uh, that's where I was having trouble with uh, finding finding books. It just seems very difficult in Japanese to find um, books for some reason. I read uh, Harry Potter in Japanese. That's the only book I really was able to find, partly because uh, you know, their books are, their ebook format seemed to be strange. Uh, anyway, uh, if anyone out there has recommendations on where to find uh, Japanese ebooks that can be imported into into Link, please please let me know. Uh, we had another question about uh, our our upcoming update, and we haven't really talked much about our update. But uh, someone's asking what's in the update. Uh, we, we are within, I don't know, it's still probably a few months away, but we are, are, are working on a major update to, to our library and to the reader. Uh, just to, a, a big part of it is just a facelift. You have to upgrade uh, the look and feel of, uh, regularly. Uh, I think that's a common across all um, platforms. And, but also, obviously, improving on what's what's there trying to you know i mean we get lots of feedback all the time from from our users uh, and and we use it ourselves so so um yeah i mean i, I won't say much more than that but hopefully that the um very much improving the the um uh, ability to find uh, the content that that you're looking for and manage the content that you're looking for and and also making it easier to find good uh, content to import so so that's a big part of of uh, what we're working on and um yeah I'll, I'll, I, I might add mark part. yeah i i had I, I looked at my russian statistics and i started uh, working on russian at link i think in 2007 or 2008 so it's more than 10 years i've been at link for a long long time and i am testing the new beta on the mobile and I am very excited. I'm like a child with a new toy. Like it's the same basic functionality, but it's just much more pleasant. So I just throw that in there for people. I think you'll enjoy what's what's being done, but there's so many different pieces that have to come together. So it's gonna take a while yet. Uh, on that question, by the way, that question about becoming fluent, I, I was gonna ask you, how many known words do you have in Russian? 90,000. So, so that just kind of gives a bit of an indication to people. And, and I know in Russian, there are more words so that your totals in Russian tend to be higher than in other languages. But yeah. a, a lot of people just don't realize how, how many known words you need to get to. Like, um, it, it doesn't have to be 90,000. I don't know what it has to be in Russian. But, y you know, I mean, I think you often say in languages like uh, French or Spanish, it's 30,000 or something. 30, 40,000. Yeah. 30, 40,000. So that's a, a big thing for everybody to focus on. It takes time. And, and that's why books as we were, as, as Paul was mentioning, books are so great because they're, they, they really drive uh, vocabulary growth and, and, and not just vocabulary growth, but by, by reading and listening that much in your target language, your, your comprehension ability to, to parse the language, understand what people are saying, understand what you're reading, just, just goes up exponentially. Uh, uh, no question about it. You know, the fact that I have 90,000 words in Russian, I don't know what that means because there's so many different forms of words in these Slavic languages. But it does mean that I have read and listened a lot. So it's kind of an indicator that, I mean, I have read, I don't know, 2 million words just on Link, let alone books that I've read here not on Link. And it just builds up that comprehension. Uh, last night on Netflix, so we briefly looked at a Russian movie, my wife and I, which we didn't like, but at least I can understand the movie. Like I understand it just as well as I understand a French movie. I, my comprehension in Russian is very good. I speak, I make more mistakes in Russian than in French, but I have listened to so much Russian that my comprehension is really very, very good. Uh, I wanted to, if I could um, uh, hear a couple of questions that I see here. Um, you know, what do you read in which languages, Stephen, Mark? Well, you know, it's, it's, it depends on the language. I've got 20 languages. Uh, I, I think typically for me, it's, it's, uh, you know, many stories to get started. Then I look for podcasts. 
Uh, in the case of Persian, I've got a, a, a lady in, in Iran who's, who has created a series on the history of Iran, which is sort of at an intermediate level, which I'm really enjoying. Um, if it's a language like Polish going from Czech or Ukrainian, I can go straight to audiobooks and ebooks because it's so similar. Um, so that's, but I also wanted to touch on the second question. How different is your reading from Krashen's N plus one theory? I don't believe in the N plus one theory. Uh, the idea in the N plus one theory is you should always, you know, be reading material that has just a small number of unknown words. So to start with, that's impossible at the beginning because it's only unknown words. And as you, per, even in the mini stories, it's, it's, there's gonna be a lot of unknown words, even though there's so much repetition in the mini stories that as a percentage, it soon comes down to a manageable level. But going forward, if, if I was only gonna deal with material that had a very small number of new words in it, I would take forever to learn the language. So I think this N plus one works if you're reading a book that you take off your bookshelf, where it's very frustrating to have a lot of unknown words. But if you're on link, I always consider a sweet spot to be like 10, 15% unknown words. That's where I'm acquiring wor new words uh, sufficiently quickly, and yet I'm not fighting an uphill battle like 30% new words is just too tough. So I think a lot of the sort of N plus one, 90%, 95% known words always applies to reading a book that you just, you know, a paper book, a traditional book. Once you're into an environment like Link, necessarily you start off with 100% new words. And then as to the extent possible, I try to aim it towards about 15% unknown words. And, yeah, uh, and we have finished, Mark. Don't we have finished? There's a question about finish. Don't we have finished, I think? Yeah, we have finished. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it should be there in the list of uh, full list of languages. You may have to open the beta language list, but uh, we have finished. Uh, we have someone asking how long it would take to reach C1 in German, considering is a native English speaker and has already reached proficiency in Irish. Four hours, he's asking if it would take four hours a day or has he has four hours a day to study. Well, I mean, if you take the example of my Russian, so here again, I mean, to me, C1 implies you speak well. So with Link, you're going to build up that potential. Uh, you should get to yourself to where you can listen to, you know, authentic podcasts, read German books, build up your vocabulary to 40, 50,000 words. But then you still have to go and find that opportunity to speak a lot. So I, I think that how quickly can you get yourself to 50,000 known words in German? Uh, and I think you can do that four hours a day in a year. Yes. Uh, with a lot of dedication. And at some point there, after three or four months, you're going to want to speak a lot. You can do that either by a you know, tutor online or you can find friends. But C1 implies you speak well. So you got to speak a lot to speak well. So Link can build you up to that 50,000 known word level, and then you're going to have to go out and find plenty of opportunity to speak. It's doable, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's doable. I, I, I think I got to see one in Chinese in a year, but I was working seven hours a day at it. So, but Chinese is a little more difficult, maybe. Okay. Uh, here's a question. I'm learning Spanish now, but I also want to learn Japanese. So should I learn the alphabet or can I just learn the language without it? Um, yeah, I, I think you can't learn Japanese without oh, Japanese. Okay. Sorry. I, I thought Spanish. Okay. Japanese. No Japanese. Yeah. 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 I think you have to learn the. If you actually, you have to be able to read to, 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 to learn enough vocabulary um to really become proficient and in order to read you you have to learn the the different scripts uh including the kanji including the kanji but certainly to start with you have to learn the hiragana and and then um from there um you'll pick up the kanji just by by um doing lessons and seeing the characters over and over and the frequent words will reappear and you'll start to learn them but uh, yeah, the, the answer is at least 
you have, in my opinion, you have you have to learn the, the script. Here, Mark, is a question. Uh, when using Link as a beginner, should I try reading the words verbally when I look them up or should I just listen and keep going? I think we necessarily, it, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. Uh, it can be fun to pronounce some of them. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You may want to pronounce some of them to yourself. You may not want to. I don't think it matters much. Uh, uh, but you say, or should I just keep going? I think the main thing is to keep going. So if you're in the mini stories, which I recommend if, as a beginner, then uh, don't just wait until you've totally aced the first story or any content that you're on. Don't, don't try to sort of totally master anything. Expose yourself to the language. So keep going, keep going, keep going. But with the individual words that you look up, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe you want to look up the conjugation table for fun, or maybe you want to pronounce it, uh, you know, dally a bit and savor that word a little bit. And you may do it differently with different words. Uh, I don't think it matters much. The main thing is to force yourself to get into more and more content, to listen to more and more content, then double back and read again, listen again. When you're bored of doing that, charge forward into new material just keep expo bombarding your brain with the language I, I have a question here about uh, using tags um and so i thought maybe it'd be worth actually demonstrating this because I, I i think tags are something that a lot of people don't use um the question the question was, uh, how can we use tags on vocabulary effectively for Russian? I see a verb and want to explore conjugations. I can see a tag for infinitive. Anyway, I, I think j just in terms of explaining the tags for those of you who don't use them, you'll see that this is Italian. Here's a verb in Italian. Here's here are some tags that are generated automatically for every, every verb in, in Italian and in a lot of languages, not all languages, but a lot of languages have these automatic tags. And so the tag will tell you that it's a verb. There's a tag that tells you it's a verb. It'll tell you the person of this verb form, if there is one. It'll tell you the tense of the verb. And then the root forms of the verb that this could possibly be from. Um, the tags are clickable. So if I click on this verb tag, it will take me to our grammar guide, which is probably worth knowing. Um, the grammar guide is available again in a lot of languages uh, and, and, and we'll, we'll explain, um, we'll, we'll talk about verbs in this language. Uh, there are lots of other, obviously things contained in those grammar guides. They're great sort of simple grammar resources that you can refer to when you have grammar questions. So uh, just to point that out to people, uh, the tense, We'll also take you back to the grammar guide and explain that tense. And then if you click on the root form of the verb, it'll actually open up a, a conjugation table for that verb. So those are actually important little hints that are tools to become familiar with, especially in languages where you might be having trouble with the verb forms. Uh, and so far as utilizing tags, these tags are automatic. I can also add manual tags. So, I mean, I could say that, uh, you know, I have a list that they say, I really want to learn this word, you know, key vocab or something. I can, I can label it with whatever tag I want. Um, I can then, in terms of reviewing, I can go to the vocabulary page and then I can click this filter and then I can, it, it suggests a few tags here, but I can, I can find this tag that I just created and see this, uh, see whatever words I have obviously for that tag, which I can then review. And this is how we kind of recommend re re using review. We kind of don't recommend using review for all the links that you create since you should be creating far too many links than you can possibly review. But if there are specific lists of words or maybe verb tenses um you know if you have problems with the uh let's see what uh, subjunctive or whatever it's called italian conjunctivo so, <laughs> anyway i can't remember 
Was it conjunct? You're looking for a subjunctive? Oh, yeah, right. Conjunctive. So, so now all of a sudden I get a list of, of uh, all my subjunctive forms of the verb in Italian. And then I can click to review that list so that if I'm having problems with that form, it's kind of a handy way to review. Um, I, I, that's how we recommend using the review. But obviously, again, we always say it's up to you. You should do what you like doing. If you like a review, I mean, it, it, especially when you start to review all the, your links per page as you're working through a, a, a lesson is also a good way to go, uh, especially if, if you like doing it and it can help you get a toehold in the language. I don't know if you have some thoughts there. Yeah, I would just add that, um... You know, the person, I think the question had to do with Russian. And um, I use the tags a lot in Russian for their case endings. Like there are some things in Russian that don't exist in English, like their verbs of motion, their aspect of verbs and their cases. Some cases are harder to remember than others. So I would tag them for the case, sometimes incorrectly. I got the wrong case. But the point is that we learn from examples. And if we can get concentrated examples of something that we can review, that kind of socks it in, in a way better than a lot of explanation. So tags are very good to give yourself a concentrated list of examples of some form that you have trouble with. So I use them a lot uh, in Russian. Still make mistakes, by the way. <laughs> uh, another question, when defining blue words and link, do you look for specific conjugations or just the basic definition? Uh, at least in terms of for myself, uh, and I think what you're asking is, do you do I define the root form or do I actually define the form of the word that I'm looking at? Uh, and I, I I prefer to define the exact form of the word that I'm looking at. I just find that that's the definition of that word, and so that's what I like to see, and that's what I like to add. But I, I guess I, again, it's it's personal preference if you would rather see the root form. Uh, uh, you can, but I, I find that the root form you'll come across eventually and you put that definite definition in for the root form, uh, but to have the actual definition of that specific instance is, is, is helpful for me. Yeah, I agree with you. I tend to, where possible, I tr want the form of that, the, the translation to conform to whatever that word is doing in a particular context but it's not always possible i tend to move quickly if there's a hint available that's just the the root form i just take that the infinitive or whatever so uh, you know but where possible i like to have it conform to whatever the function of the word is in that sentence um i also wanted to answer there was a question here eu gostaria de saber quanto tempo por, por dia tenho que estudar inglês how many hours a day do i have to study english Uma hora. Like to me, it's one hour. If you're doing less than one hour, you're not going to achieve much. And that's easily done. 45 minutes of listening. Call it an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. So 45 minutes of listening wherever you are, working out in the car, in the bus, whatever. And then another half an hour, you know, saving words and stuff like that. So uma hora, eh, 45 minutos, escutando, eh, 15, 30 minutos. Trabalhando con el link, o link. That's my answer there. You should be able to get in an hour and 15 minutes a day. Uh, and is Duolingo a good app to learn languages was another one. Again, I haven't had much experience with Duolingo. I got in there and there were a lot of strange sentences about the dog ate the snake and stuff like that. So I didn't find it all that helpful, but a lot of people use it. A lot of people like it. Uh, it's something you can do. You can do it in conjunction with Link, or if you like doing it and you continue doing it, it's it's all good. Exposure to the language is good, but I don't have enough experience to say, you know, I don't think it takes you as far as Mark said earlier. The advantage with Link is that however you get yourself going in the language, at some point you have to get to real stuff, audiobook, ebook, movies, newspaper articles. And I think that's where the limits of Duolingo are. And I think they'll tell you as much. I mean, they don't, they actually have said they don't claim to teach you a language. They, they, I mean, to get you to fluency, they, they, it's, it's, it's something to get you started. It's kind of fun. It's better than playing video games <laughs> in terms of developing your skills.
Um, I had a question here. Oh, I'm Brazilian. I have 23,000 known words in English and 27,000 known words in Spanish. When could I start to speak? How many hours should I speak per week? I mean, you should start to speak. I think uh, I, I, once I have 10,000 words, uh, if I have the time, I like to speak. It's fun to try it out. It, it provides more variety. It, it gives you a sense of where your problems are. It's, it's fun to connect with a native speaker. Uh, even three, I used to wait longer with Russian. I waited a long time. Uh, if you want to speak, speak. You certainly have enough words to speak. And uh, yeah. Uh, let's see what else we have. There's uh, one here. Does listening to the podcast over and over without understanding help assimilating the language? Not much. Maybe some, but not very much. Uh, I always want to be able to read what I'm listening to. If I understand essentially nothing, I don't think I'm doing much. I mean, it's not like it's zero, but it's rather an ineffective use of time. Uh, Steve, as an English teacher, what would you recommend I do to teach effectively? Grammar instruction and immediate feedback is expected by the school, the students themselves. It's a problem. I mean, if I were an English teacher, I have a curriculum, I have a school director, they expect certain things, uh, test results and so forth. I would try to persuade my students that they're going to achieve better results on any test if they do a lot of listening and reading. I would encourage them to read more and listen more. And uh, if they have questions about grammar, we can discuss those in class. Uh, and if we can discuss them in, if these people are learning English, that we can discuss it in English, that's good for them. Uh, they won't necessarily remember the explanations, but if the whole thing is in English, that's good. And I would just encourage them that, uh, you know, in order, if, if they're motivated to learn, they have to get to where they're consuming a lot of the language. So, you know, maintain whatever the requirements of the curriculum are, but try to encourage them to do a lot of listening and reading. Get them on link. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm two months into Russian with great success. I talk to a lot of people, but it's difficult learning when I talk to them. As soon as I don't know the words, I can't keep the conversation. And without switching to English, it's hard to have an interesting conversation. What do you suggest to do? Keep talking about the same things over and over or switch to English to ask for help? Well, my uh, suggestion is that uh, you want to have far more input activities than online discussions. Uh, very frustrating, and I tried it in Korean at an early stage. If you don't understand what the person is saying and you have a very limited vocabulary, you're always talking about where they live, is it raining? It's, it's not very satisfying. Uh, the other thing that I found useful when I had real trouble speaking at an early stage, let's say in Arabic, because I had trouble reading, then I would read with my teacher because I wasn't confident that when I was reading in Arabic that I was pronouncing the words correctly or in Persian because the writing system, it's not a, it's not a one to one. It's not like Spanish where you pronounce it like you read it. So if you're at a level in Russian where you're still, because the Cyrillic alphabet is not as difficult as the Arabic alphabet, but it's always difficult to read in another alphabet. So one thing, if you want to have that interaction with the tutor, Again, I would go to the mini stories, uh, get the mini stories, read the mini stories on, you know, during your conversation with the tutor and then have a bunch of questions and answers with your tutor on the content of that mini story because the mini story already has a bunch of questions in there. So you now you're kind of, you got some momentum and that'll build up your confidence. I think the mini stories are a great sort of base content to bring into a conversation when you are at a very early stage in the language. Uh, which is the next language to be added to link? Uh, I can't really remember now what uh, is next. We have a few we, waiting. We basically add languages if we are provided, uh, if we have volunteers provide us with the uh, 60 mini stories. Um, but I, I can't, we do have some that are waiting to be put up. Um, probably won't be put up until after we've launched our new version. I can't honestly remember what they are right now. Uh, so yeah, sorry, was it Thai or Georgian? Thai or, or <laughs> Georgian was, was another one. Uh, um, yeah, so anyway, uh, learn Georgian. 
there was a question here from Zviatoslav. I struggle with German. Do you like how it sounds? I like all the languages. And are we son and father? Yes. <laughs> I find that the languages sound better the more you understand them. And when Absolutely. you don't understand a language, it can sound quite... Um, you, you, I find that's when you find you don't enjoy the, a particular language. And the more you understand, the, the more you enjoy it. There's always uh, a resistance to a new language because it's hard and it sounds strange and stuff. And as you get into it more, say with German, where they have these somewhat convoluted sentences, after a while, as you get more and more comfortable with this, it's actually fun and it's enjoyable. I find that with every language. Once you get into it, it becomes more and more enjoyable. At least for me. What word count do you recommend on Link Before outputting in Chinese? Well... Since I haven't learned Chinese, like haven't studied on Link, but I think that 5,000 to 10,000 is a level where you can at least start talking to people. And then it's gonna be, it's a, it's a matter of how do you wanna spend your time and your money? So I think it's personal. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule. How do you go about learning a script? If you were to start Hindi tomorrow, how would you go about it? Well, I have the most, the most recent, so recently, of course, Cyrillic, going back to my first exposure to Russian, and then Korean, Hangul, and then Greek, uh, and then, of course, Ukrainian, which is slightly different from Russian, but essentially the same, and, and most recently with Arabic and Persian. So let's start with Arabic and Persian. You've got four forms of each letter, depending on whether it's on its own or at the beginning or the middle or the end of a word. Very difficult. Changes form doesn't necessarily get pronounced the same way. It might be wa, va, very difficult. The thing is, it just takes time. So you, you study these letters, what they mean. You keep on getting them wrong. You think it's this letter, but it's some other letter. You read more. It, it's just a gradual process of listening and reading, a lot of listening and reading at the same time. The uh, Arabic text-to-speech is very helpful. Unfortunately, we don't have text-to-speech in Persian. But if you're getting used to a new script where we have text-to-speech, like if it's Cyrillic, use the text-to-speech. And it's just the brain will gradually get better at it. It's not going to get worse. So you just have to keep going. Uh, I studied Spanish in college, and I'm growing bored with Spanish, but I recognize the utility. My heart wants to learn Chinese. How do you know when to move on to the next language? When your heart wants to move on, move on. <laughs> Your Spanish will only improve when you go back to it. Um, when you first start a new language, do you use subtitles when watching movies? Is it best to use target subtitles or English ones? I mean, when I started into Russian, I watched movies with English subtitles because I was enjoying the movie and the movie was stimulating to me, but I wasn't learning Russian. Uh, if you want to use movies for learning the language, you need subtitles in the language you're learning. And, you know, if it's on YouTube, I think, or Netflix, you can import that dialogue, those subtitles into Link and learn those words. But I, I think watching with English subtitles, I mean, it helps to the extent that you understand some, uh, but it's not, a, not something that I do to learn the language. But it's, yeah, sometimes it helps you understand what you're hearing. You would have missed it otherwise, but because the subtitle is there in English, you kind of pick up on what you heard. But I, I prefer to watch with subtitles in the target language. And, and it does this, the subtitles in the target language do the same. They help you understand much better than with just listening alone. Uh, but at least it's in your target language and not. Uh, like I found, for example, when I was going through Netflix and there is this uh, app called Learning with Netflix, where they gave, and, and it was difficult because they, they spoke Egyptian Arabic, they had the subtitles in uh, standard Arabic, and they also had English translation. But I never, I found after a while, I didn't look at the English translation. I looked at the standard Arabic, which was still different from the spoken Arabic, but it's because another opportunity to read in that language, like you gotta get to reading, reading is so important. So even reading subtitles in the language is training your brain to read that language which I think is, is very important. Ultimately, you have to read a lot. Uh, 
I'm studying Spanish and sometimes complex sentences have features like verbs in both the preterite and imperfect are too long to fit in a single link. Any workarounds for this? Like verbs? So in the same sentence, some ver verbs will be in the preterite and some will be in the imperfect. Yeah, that happens in English. But I don't understand the question that features are too long to fit in a single link. I don't, uh, you mean you're trying to save a phrase that's too long. I, I, I assume you're trying to save both forms of the word in the same phrase, maybe. At any we, rate, we, we limit the length of phrases. We, we, um, we don't want you saving sentences or long chunks because it, it, it has a number of unintended consequences in the, in the rest of the system. So um, yeah, I saved two smaller chunks, I think, uh, if, if that's the issue that you're having. And uh, this is an issue that comes oh, gonna... with regard to separable verbs in German. And um, it's just not that easy to save huge segments, sections of text. So we, we don't, um, we don't allow it. If you want to, to translate a whole sentence, there's sentence view for that, uh, but you shouldn't be saving full sentences. The idea is you want to uh, save words and shorter phrases as chunks that you can learn and learn to use. So we, we, there's no real reason to save long uh, passages because you're not likely to reuse long passages of, of text as much. Paul, you were going to comment on that? I was going to say, like, yeah, I think what, what he's talking about, because I've had it before where I've, like, had a really long sentence that I've wanted to translate, and it, the, the, like, highlight only goes so far, and you've got to try and, like, break it up. But sometimes the, um, like, the word changes depending on, like, what, how it's used. And, like, sometimes you'll, you'll click half of it, and it'll say, like, the one translation, but really you need the other one once the other, other half the sentence is in, if that makes sense. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, don't, I mean, I, I share Mark's view. I find that I want to save for, uh, shorter phrases because shorter phrases are going to repeat. Shorter phrases can be tagged, are useful to use. It's handy to have phrases that you can trot out that you don't have to make everything up word for word. You have these prefabricated little phrases you can use. Whereas sentences tend to be more individual, like each sentence, long sentence, like they don't repeat that often. Sentences tend to be unique far more than phrases. So I focus on saving phrases that eventually I want to be able to use. Um, and that might reoccur in future lessons uh, and so on. Do you, do you uh, Paul, do you use the uh, sentence view when you're studying or the full page? I usually use the full page. Uh huh. I find it easier with the audio boost because um, usually you can just like, kind of read the full bit as opposed to having to click, click in it to the next page. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to sort of flip back and forth. I use the sentence view. If I don't understand the sentence, then I'll flip to sentence view to get a translation and see what, uh, what the sentence translation tells me just as another potential clue or, or, or way to understand what I'm, what I'm reading. I find the sentence view in the week, the languages where I'm not very strong, like Arabic and Persian, I much prefer to be in sentence view. If I'm strong in the language, then I can stay in page view. I also wanted to, if I could, Mark, there was a question here, which I think is a really good one from Jan. How do you get back your motivation during a slump? So, yeah, I mean, language learning, unfortunately, progress is very slow. Uh, maybe in the initial few months, we have this sense of all of a sudden we understand something. All of a sudden we can say a few things where before we started, we knew nothing. And then we hit somebody described it the other day as the desert, crossing the desert. I was talking to, to a podcaster. And this is the doldrums. This is that long, long, long period where word frequency has dropped. So we're not encountering these words as often as we did in the first, say, thousand words where they come up all the time. We don't really have the impression we're getting much better. We're struggling with content that's difficult. We don't understand. And so it's easy to get demotivated. So what do you do when you're demotivated? Well, I, some of the things that I do uh, we talked about, like uh, Chris talked about his 50 links a day goal. So if you have a mechanical goal, you have to create 50 links. So whether you like it or not, you got to get into some new content where there's some, you know, enough blue words that you can at least get your 50 links. So even if you have the impression that you aren't getting any better, at least you saved 50 links. 
So you did something. And we know that if you are active in the language, you will get better. You may not think you're getting better, but you will get better. And every so often I look at my page in Arabic and I still don't understand when they're talking, but look at my page, it's mostly white. There's some yellow and there's some blue. Whereas it used to be covered in blue. So I remind myself that I've improved. So I think it's important to give yourself credit for what you have achieved. So, you know, do some things that mechanically force you to do something, give yourself credit for what you've achieved or take a rest. You know, if you're really not motivated, the other thing you can do is vary the kind of stuff you're listening to. Maybe your motivation is slumping because you're doing too much repetitious, you know, work with the mini stories. So then go off and find yourself some interesting content. Maybe you're demotivated because the interesting content is too difficult. Go back to the mini stories or look for some intermediate content, vary your activity, go and review your words in flashcards, even though that's not something that I do a lot of. When my motivation kind of drops, I want to vary my activity, then I'll do that. Or maybe I'll get an online tutor and have a few sessions. So that I think varying your activity can help recharge your motivation. Or in some cases, go and learn another language. And then when you come back to that first language, you'll be refreshed. You won't feel as if you're sort of, you know, fighting this uphill battle without any results. So, so those are some of the things that I would recommend to get your motivation back. Uh, I, I want to learn Chinese and bought living language Mandarin Chinese to get a basic vocab since it feels difficult to start with no vocabulary on link. Is that a good strategy? Um, you know, I bought all of those living language. I, I find it, I find them difficult. Uh, so link has the following advantage. You can click on a word and immediately see the meaning. You can save that word. Your page is interactive. You're seeing your progress, fewer and fewer blue words. Um, you've got, you know, you, such a variety of content to listen to. You've got audio and text for everything. A lot of these programs like Living Language, they have a lot of English in their audio, which I, I can't listen to more than once. Um, so it's, it's another way of covering the material. It provides more explanation of how the language works and the structure and that kind of thing, which can be useful to have. Um, I think it's a good thing. I, I mean, I typically, I don't go for, I might have used living language. I tend to go to teach yourself. I tend to have another little book because again, variety covering the same material in different ways is a good thing. So I have my little book, might be teach yourself. I might have it by my bedside. I flip through that. Then at other times in the day, I'm listening to Link. I might even listen to the teach yourself thing, even though I get annoyed at having to listen to the English, you know, explanation. You know, in the following chapter, John and Mary visit their friends, Mei Li and Ching Chang. And we don't need that after a while, you know? So yeah, it's part of the strategy, keeps things uh, varied and stuff, sure. Uh, at a higher level, do you think reading books, novels should be done freely? Uh, i.e. not looking up unknown words as you go. My thing is, if I pick up a book, like a paper book, I don't look up anything. If I'm on link, I look up everything. That's just how I do it. And reading away from the computer, reading a book, which is not so easy for me to do in Arabic, but certainly in Polish, I can take a book that's got 10% unknown words, and it's still enjoyable to read it as a book and I don't look up anything. Uh, whereas if I'm looking, even if I'm reviewing a mini story in Polish and there's a word I've forgotten, I'll look it up. Okay, well, but if, and maybe we'll end on this question here. Uh, how can one become capable of writing in a foreign language? We haven't spoken about writing today. What should be your, the journey for this skill development in your opinion? Well, you got to write. So we have the ability on link, you can post your writing and people will correct it on our, what's it called? Exchange, right? We have a writing exchange and, and then it depends how serious you are about your writing. I mean, if you are really concerned about writing, you can submit writing to tutors and, and pay them to correct it and comment on it and analyze it in more depth. So we have also, if, if you're at an early stage, like for example, for me to write in Arabic or even in Greek is very difficult but I can save phrases 
and then use the dictation function when I review these phrases. And that then forces me to write those. So I can begin by learning to write because the, the writing system is, is so difficult for me, the alphabet. So at least I develop some initial capability to even write anything in the language. And thereafter, I might compose something. I might have a diary, like a lot of people keep diaries. Or I might translate from, you maybe take a larger chunk of text and translate it into the target language and maybe submit it. Uh, it you know, I find that initially to actually have to compose something is maybe more difficult. If you just translate something, then you don't have to worry about what you're going to write. You just have to translate it. And then you can submit that either to a tutor to have it formally corrected or on our exchange to have volunteers correct it. But it is a great thing to do, there's no question. And the uh, writing exchange is very popular and, and you usually get lots of great feedback there and that's entirely free on the community on the web app. You do have to be on the web. Um, okay, well with that, uh, we'll wrap it up for today. Thanks very much, Paul and Chris Thank for joining you, us and sharing your story. And um, yeah, we look forward to uh, doing this uh, again next week in the meantime everybody have a have a, a good week stay safe and, stay and safe. happy happy linking happy easter too yeah happy easter okay bye 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 bye